Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. My name is Jim Ambusky. I'm a historian and senior producer at R2 Studios, which is the podcast division of the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media at George Mason University. I also happen to sit on Red Hills Research Advisory Council, and I'm delighted to be with you here tonight to host an event with Dr. Sarah Giorgini of the Massachusetts Historical Society. And we'll be looking at the friendship, the unlikely friendship of Patrick Henry and John Adams. Um, before I bring Dr. Giorgini on stream tonight, I just want to thank our co-sponsors for this evening. First, Red Hill, which is in Brookneal, Virginia, which is the final home of Patrick Henry, uh, who retired there in the 1790s. And you can learn more about going to redhill.org about Red Hill and Patrick Henry and his life. Also like to thank the Massachusetts Historical Society, which as I recently learned is the oldest historical society in the United States founded in 1791. And you can learn more by going to mhs1791.org. Also wanna thank Virginia Humanities for sponsoring in part the live stream series you'll be seeing coming from Red Hill in the recent months or in the coming months, I should say. Thanks very much to them for a grant that supported a lot of the infrastructure that's making these kinds of streams possible. So uh, I do want to bring on Sarah Giorgini here in just a second. Uh, you, some of you may know her from her previous work. As uh, I mentioned, she is at the Massachusetts Historical Society, where she is the series editor of the papers of John Adams. Uh, she's also an author in her own right, most recently, publishing Household Gods, The Religious Lives of the Adams Family, which was uh, put, published by Oxford University Press in 2019. And without further ado, let's go ahead and bring Dr. Giorgini on screen and get this party started. Sarah, welcome to tonight's main event. It's great to see you. Hi, Jim. Great to see you too. Thanks to you, to everyone watching, and to all of my scholar colleagues at Red Hill. I'm very excited to talk with you, as I always am. We've, we've done a few things together, and so I'm excited to get another crack at you. Uh, and apparently, you're going to take a swing at me tonight, too, so that'll be fun. <laughs> uh, but before we get started, I do want to uh, entreat our audience to ask questions throughout the evening. We will have a, a period of Q&A for the audience uh, at, the, at the end of our program, which will run about 40 minutes today. And if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, you can simply comment uh, on the stream itself and we will see those questions uh, and we'll come to your comments and questions later in the evening. But Sarah, we wanted to talk about Patrick Henry and John Adams because they are in a sense an unlikely figure. I think when we, we think about luminaries from New England and Virginia, it's easier to think about Thomas Jefferson and John Adams or George Washington and John Adams or, or whatnot. But Henry and Adams um, are an interesting pair. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about when the two men first encounter each other. So John Adams knew of Patrick Henry and his work as a lawyer, as a revolutionary, as really a path-breaking opposer to British imperial policy long before they actually crossed paths at the First Continental Congress in Philadelphia. John Adams is one who, as he builds the script for revolution that he's going to publicize and get people to read in works like Thoughts on Government and in his dissertation on the canon and feudal law, he does the reading. And he knows a little bit about Patrick Henry's ideology of the way that he is perceiving and prying at the cracks of the British imperial system. And he really, I think, admires it. So before they meet, they kind of know of each other. There's kind of this reverberation in the revolutionary field where they have some sense of their unity on some really important political points. And of course, Patrick Henry himself is no slouch in the courtroom. And John Adams is a pretty well-known well-credentialed colonial lawyer. So he has some idea of Henry's renown, both in the courtroom and outside of it. But when he first rolls up to the Continental Congress, John Adams makes a point of recording the people whom the Virginia delegates are touting as the best speakers. And he hears about Patrick Henry 
But what he hears first is that the speaker they should really be listening to is one Colonel Washington, because he can rouse a room even more than Henry can. So typical John Adams, he knows of someone, he admires them, but he can be a little bit difficult to thaw in person um, and become friends with. So he has a sense of Henry. Um, and I think Henry has a sense of him too. John Adams is a fairly well-known, you know, New England lawman at this time. Well, I want to come to the subject of law in just a bit, but the, the remark about Colonel Washington strikes me as extremely perplexing because he would be the last person you would think would be deemed an orator in any sense of the word, especially as mm -hmm. he's known for his reserve in, in public. Mm-hmm. And it, oh, go That's ahead. That's absolutely please. right. Yeah. Well, and it, it also speaks to this kind of weird, I don't know if weird's the right word, but there is this, I don't know, connection bridge between New England and Virginia that seems to persist from the revolutionary period into the early Republic until New York and Virginia kind of supplants that old connection. What, what in your mind explains this affinity that Virginians and New Englanders have for each other, even though they grow up in very different worlds. I mean, in Virginia, it's a world of somewhat aristocracy, you might say, and, uh, built on the backs of enslavement and, and enslaved people, whereas slavery is not unknown in New England, of course, but it's much less integral to society than it is in Virginia. What, what kind of accounts for the connections New Englanders and Virginians have for each other? So this is a great question, right? Because Massachusetts and Virginia, and this happens a lot almost right away in the 19th century retelling of American revolutionary history, are always presented as the two great unlikely pillars of independence, right? The two kind of opposing ends of an ideological bridge that are able to come together. Some of it has to do with their history, right? They're very well populated. They're primarily agrarian. They have gone through some kind of charter royal company kind of deal with Great Britain. They have some very familiar points of relationship. They also have a strong kind of religious base, right? So Anglicanism in Virginia, Congregationalism in Massachusetts, something where the spirit of law and change is wedded to a communal religion. Those are all things that help Virginians and Massachusetts citizens um, become Americans together. I think it's something where they have enough of um, kind of a web of connections that they can splay out and say, okay, this is, this is kind of how we get along. There's also an incredible, and I think you can't discount this, there's an incredible kind of history of education in both places, right? Of higher education, of access to law, to medicine, um, to, to everything like that. So they both come from backgrounds which are so starkly different, right? Patrick Henry comes from a world of slavery. We like to think that John Adams comes from a world that's untouched by slavery. We know that's not true. There is a spectrum and a really a specter of unfreedom that haunts New England well into the 18th century um, on the cusp of the revolution. So they have these kind of long educated dialogues happening in both societies about what is liberty, what is slavery, what is our relationship to empire. Both regions are incredibly important for trade networks throughout the British Empire. Both networks have serious money, troops, and ideology invested in, you know, conflicts like the Seven Years' War. So there's a shared past that they can draw on. Now, all of that means that going into the revolution, there's still a lot of fear in the minds of New England citizens that Virginia is not going to back them that they're simply not going to care if Boston's port gets shut down, which it does. They are not going to care if Bostonians hold a tea party on a cold December night to prove that the empire isn't all. There's a lot of concern, and I think the my favorite expression of this actually comes in a letter here held in the Adams Papers that we might all know. It's sometimes known as the Remember the Ladies letter because it's the letter that Abigail Adams writes to her husband, John, March 31st, 1776. And actually long before you get to that very famous statement of the need for women's citizenship in the New Republic, you have Abigail saying, what about Virginia? Are people who 
refuse to liberate their own people going to back our cause for independence. Um, so there's real concern on the part mm -hmm. of New England that the revolution is just gonna happen for them and that they're not gonna have any backup. But because they have this shared past, because they have these common moral, intellectual and historical points of interest, they're able to kind of band together. My favorite joke, um, historically speaking, in one of the Adams Papers introductions is that the American Revolution happens because it's the sole truce between the Lee family and the Adams family, between North and South. It's the product of this ability to discuss and disagree and still come to a covenant of feeling about how to proceed with the drive for union. Um, so there's, there's a lot of, I think, serious intellectual recognition that now is the time to hold aside regional conflict to a degree and get those 13 clocks striking at once. Well, a lot of that intellectual discussion is taking place in the form of letters. And one of the challenges mm -hmm. that we have for studying Patrick Henry is that his correspondence, his surviving correspondence is not voluminous. You know, unfortunately, uh, the specter of fire haunts archives and libraries and personal papers and fire consumed a great deal of Henry's papers around about the turn of the 20th century, unfortunately. So we've got some, and there was some material published by descendants in the 19th century, early 20th century. And, you know, every once in a while, as letters do, they often pop up. But we, we know less about Henry than we would like in certain ways, although John Kukla has written a marvelous biography recently of, of Henry, mm -hmm. in which he contextualizes Henry and his world to make up for the lack of a lot of primary source evidence. But... Tell us a little bit about then if if we've got this absence of of letters from Henry and we're using other sources to kind of flesh him out. You as a documentary editor uh, know what that's kind of like firsthand in terms of working with primary materials. And so what is it like then to work with the correspondence of John Adams to figure out the kinds of things we've just been talking about, you know, especially with the relationship between Virginia and New England as they march toward revolution? Mm -hmm. So the Adams Family Papers, which are held here at the Massachusetts Historical Society, were open for research, um, were available in the reading room six days a week for researchers to work with them in person and via microfilm and through our digital editions online at any time. Now, the reason we make them so available is because there's a lot of them. So a quarter of a million manuscript pages, 10 generations worth of the American experience really dating from the earliest American roots in Massachusetts Bay all the way through to the early 20th century. So quite a broad arc of American history, cultural criticism, and knowledge from a family that operates at the heart of political power for more than two centuries. So the Adams Family Papers are full of love letters, state secrets, everything in between. All that said, there's stuff we don't have. The thing to do when you're working in an archive this large is to look for silences too, whose voices are not represented. Where do we expect the Adamses to comment and they fall silent? So we think about that a lot. The correspondence really that presidents write that we can uncover in the Adams Family Papers is fascinating, absolutely. It tells us how people are trying to lead a brand new creation, a federal government. It shows us how John Adams struggles, for example, with something that I bet Patrick Henry struggled with too, which is this generation of putting a theory into practice, right? So all the ideas they have about how to set up a federal government, and then they have to do it. So we see that as well in the archive and we kind of have to shine the light both ways when we do that. But all that said, some of my favorite letters are not the ones they send, it's the letters they get. It's absolutely ordinary everyday asks from people who need a job, want to help their kids, are curious about what's going on with the French Revolution, are wondering what the next step might be for cultural organizations like the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Because in this period, what you see in the heart of the Adams Papers, so comprising that late 18th to early 19th century kind of period, is a direct dialogue between people and power. It used to be that you could write to a president and he'd write back. And this, I think, is a really interesting kind of dynamic 
Certainly, long before he's president, John Adams inculcates this practice of correspondence as a way to gather evidence, to work out his theories, to see what's working or not. And actually, for all the handful of correspondence that we have between John Adams and Patrick Henry, they tell us a lot, right, about how these two men approach creating a government. Well, and it's interesting you talk about silences because it immediately made me think about the fact that during the uh, constitutional period, Henry emerges as an ardent anti-federalist. He's very suspicious about centralized power, you know, whereas John Adams is writing defense of the constitution while he's abroad. Uh, Henry's here in the muck and mire uh, in Richmond, trying to push back against the idea that there should be a federal constitution. And of course he is writing letters and he writes a very famous letter to George Washington, which he says, mm -hmm. I, you know, I just can't wrap my mind around this, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And this is a very politely, but then mm -hmm. in the ratification convention, he is declaiming against mm -hmm. the constitution as an overreach and, you know, a potential march towards tyranny. And, you know, fortunately we have people who were there in that convention taking, you know, reasonably good notes, I mean, not as much as you know, well as we would like, but you see in that moment, as you were saying, where people like Henry are articulating theories of power and pushing it back against, mm -hmm. you know, something that a Washington or an Adams believed in. And, it also kind of made me think uh, about the fact, you know, as we've talked about that they're lawyers and these two guys are involved in two of the most famous early American uh, legal cases before the American Revolution. You know, we'll, we, we can talk, I think, a little bit about Adams and the Boston Massacre trial in a second, but where I think we see Henry first emerge on the stage as a critic of empire is really 1763 with the so-called Parsons cause. And for those taking notes at home, just sort of a brief overview, like in the 18th century, Anglican ministers were paid in tobacco uh, and not money, uh, which is uh, something, of course, you would not do today. And, you know, around about uh, mid-century, you'd, you'd get about 16,000 pounds of tobacco annually, which worked out to about two cents a pound. Well, in the 1750s, the tobacco market collapses, makes uh, the demand for tobacco very high drives up the price. And a lot of these ministers and government officials who are being paid by the state, and we have to remember at this time, there's no separation between church and state. They think, great, we're going to make a lot of money because mm -hmm. the value of, of tobacco has gone up. Uh, Virginia's government says, hang on a second, this is wholly unfair to taxpayers. We're going to pass these acts that tie or that, you know, really restrict the salary to, to two cents a pound. And and that'll be that. And Anglican ministers start petitioning as they do, not to a president, but to the king himself and arguing this is unfair, that this act violates their rights as the king's subjects. The Privy Council heeds those petitions. They uh, convince the king to veto it. So he does. And then there are ministers who suit for back pay in Virginia courts and Henry is in charge of defending the vestry uh, that is being sued. And even though he's not successful, uh, he comes out very ardently in that moment as a proponent of the idea that the colonies should be left to govern themselves in the sense where it does the most benefit for the people and argues, you know, why would the king veto this act when it's actually a design to protect the taxpayers and it's only you know infringing you know potentially the rights of a couple of of ministers not a couple there was a lot more ministers to be sure but that he comes out and says you know essentially the king is kind of acting like a tyrant here and that's really the moment where you see him emerge as both a critic of the empire but also someone who is beginning to articulate the idea that the colonies are in a much different relationship with Great Britain and Great Britain thinks it is. And if Henry's using the law in that case to make those kinds of arguments, I wonder then when we get to 1770 and the British troops fire into a crowd in Boston, who ends up defending the British troops? It's John Adams. Like, how does that happen? And what is Adams's rationale for taking on a role that at first glance, might have seemed to have put him on the wrong side of the emerging patriot cause. Mm. 
So, I mean, Adams had to take the case, right? I mean, this is, this is a guy who is magnetized to making controversial decisions. And he, he never really stops that throughout his entire political career. When the Boston Massacre kind of trial offer comes around, he's already been a lawyer for some time, right? And he has been riding circuit. He's been living the colonial lawyer life, um, much like Patrick Henry popping through taverns to have court cases heard. They're usually, you know, not quite as dramatic as this. Um, but he has been writing and thinking about the relationship between empire and colony for some time. And this actually, I think part of why he takes this case has to do with why Henry takes his case, which gets us back to Massachusetts and Virginia, an unlikely but totally necessary friendship, um, which is both of these colonies have been getting increasingly used to being models of self-government, right? So mm -hmm. having their own kind of semi-independent um, situation, whether it's in terms of judiciary or legislature, or anything else, the way that they run, they've been getting less British for a long time. Um, it's not that anyone went to bed British and woke up American in the revolution, but there has been kind of a gradual shift throughout his legal career where he has been increasingly turning full face toward this break. Mm -hmm. um, and he has to take this case because it's the only way to show that British soldiers are going to get a fair shake, that the United, what's going to be the United States has an independent judiciary that's fair. There is a legal tradition that you can trust on to have a fair trial. This means the world to him, the idea that you have some kind of an independent judiciary. And he's OK with some of these structures moving in before formal independence happens. He kind of likes the gradual independence idea and he sees this trial, I think, as an opportunity to do it. He knows he'll be unpopular. Um, he knows that this is something that will rankle, I don't know, perhaps his second cousin, Sam Adams. Um, <laughs> it's something that will certainly trouble the town of Boston, but the situation of the trial is such that, you know, the trial is repeatedly delayed. Um, it lasts a little longer than trials usually do. He has a banger of a closing speech that we've been able to reconstruct with the very famous tagline of facts are stubborn things um, in the John Adams legal papers, which you can also read online. Um, but he really sets up this idea in the popular imagination that you can get a fair trial here no matter who you are. And that is a really big, simple, important idea um, for a country trying to become a country. Um, so he has to take the case. And as I said, he's kind of moving into something that's going to be the capstone of his career as it is. So it's kind of good timing. He's going to take a different path than Henry does. Henry embraces state service, right? He builds his life around Virginia. And I think that's so important for him to do. Adams perceives something when he goes up to challenge notions of empire and class, I would say very importantly, and colony in the Boston Massacre Trials courtroom. And that is the idea that he's going to be a statesman next, that he's gonna fling himself out into this world of empire and see what he can accomplish on the world stage. It's a plot twist he did not see coming in terms of his career arc. And it's something that I think is such an interesting contrast to Henry who doubles down, right, ends up you know, commanding a regiment, the First Virginia, correct? And then right. Adams, my dear portly little Adams is not gonna be commanding any regiment. However, he does kind of throw himself at Versailles, at The Hague, at Spain, at England. Like, so he has a different war um, than Henry does. And I think, I actually think that's something that's so important for us to remember. People don't plan on what this revolution does to their careers. And it torques both of these men into very necessary roles. Part of the roles, as you say, uh, are giving bang up speeches. Uh, you know, it's facts are stubborn things in the Boston Massacre, give me liberty or give me death. In Henry's case, these two men emerge as very powerful orators, mm -hmm. uh, such that Henry is often known as the voice of the revolution. Mm -hmm. I want to know where does 
how do you train to become that kind of orator? I mean, we watch court TV today and they're like, it's not exciting. Like, and, and particularly as, as someone who's a historian, I want my Daniel Webster giving huge speeches in the Senate in the 1850s. You know, I want to Henry or I want an Adams making, you know, declamations against tyrants in the courtroom, which they, in a sense, did. Where do they learn to do this kind of work? I have some potential thoughts about Henry, but I'd love to hear about Adams. Yeah, so with John Adams, kind of in the 18th century, if you wanted to be a revolutionary, you went to Harvard, because that's where you got a classical education. You certainly had to declaim a couple times a week. You learned all the speeches you had to learn, and then you, you kind of practiced your little heart out. Um, so Adams has a very kind of straightforward style. He has a few punchy taglines, but he lacks I think Henry's absolute crystalline quality. Hmm. To me, reading Henry, he is bright, bold, and of course too brief, right? So he is someone who makes a very different appeal than Adams does. Adams, when he makes an appeal, whether it's in a court case or in any of his revolutionary writings or in a letter, he will pummel you with evidence. When he has an argument, he will pile evidence and pile it and pile it. And he will continue the same arguments and theories in correspondence over time. And when he picks up a shiny new gem of evidence, he will lift that up for your appraisal as well. So he never really drops an argument. He just keeps piling evidence on it. When you look at what we've been able to reconstruct of his speeches, he can be a little bit of a sidewinder in the courtroom when he's talking. And what he does is he wraps his argument in a lot of history. So he likes to throw back to 17th century English jurists. He likes to bring up any classical, you know, Roman or Greek orators that he can. Um, what he's trying to do is ground the American legal tradition with some legitimacy, right? Some scholarly bona fides to say that, you know, we can absolutely do everything that the British jurist can do. What I noticed from Henry is that he has a very different pitch, and I'd love to get your take on this. Yeah. My theory is that Henry has this wonderful base of evangelical Protestantism that is part and parcel of his world. And when Henry makes an appeal, it is through emotion more than reason. What he does is channel the evangelical vibe of the era, which is to say, first of all, save your soul, but second, save society. Mm -hmm. So you get this kind of dual um, approach from Henry. And then secondly, he has this idea that emotion trumps reason. And he is very good at embellishing his speeches with appeals to shared values, right? So the community wants this. If you look at an Adam speech, there's a lot of these people in the past did this, we can do that. With Henry, there's a lot of I, 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 <laughs> and then you, you, you. So it's a different setup between the two. It's a different dialogue that they're creating with the audience. Um, and I attribute some of that to Henry's evangelical influence. The second thing that's really important about comparing the two, or maybe this is the fifth thing, because I got really into this question, it's a great one, thank you, um, is that this is the great 18th century divide. Are you a man of sense or sensation? Do you listen to emotion or to reason? And to me, Henry is all about the sensation and Adams is all about the sense, right? Adams is all about reason. Henry to me is about emotion all of these things are equally valid and they both play around with both of them. But if I had to tip it one way or the other, mm -hmm. that's how it'd go. So it's a, it's a wonderful question. I'd love to hear what you think. Yeah, I th it's really interesting. And Henry has such a circuitous route to becoming a lawyer more than, than Adams does. I mean, he, Henry once is, you know, takes a crack at being a storekeeper a couple of times mm -hmm. and out, uh, you know, wants to be a planter it sort of, Sort of works out somewhat in, in his early life. Much much uh, later, though, it's it's a little more fruitful. But he is not like Adams, where he goes to Harvard, or he goes to William and Mary, or whatnot. He studies and reads law, and you know, it, as you well know, in the 18th century, study for law, you could either go to England uh, at the Inns of Court, or you could read with a lawyer and essentially read these very 
dense, and let me emphasize dense, law books <laughs> on English common law, which Henry does. And the old joke goes, and this is actually coming from Jefferson, so it's probably suspect, is that Henry read a law books for six weeks and then sat for the bar in front of George With, uh, who was a very famous, prominent Virginia lawyer and actually Jefferson's teacher, and passed the bar by the skin of his teeth. Now, it probably was a little more he had a little more skin on his teeth than I think Jefferson gives him credit for. But Henry becomes a practicing lawyer about 1760 and then, you know, embarks on this quest. But then to your point about where he learns the oratory, what strikes me as very interesting is the fact that, and, you know, I think we often forget this, is Henry is a first generation American. His, mm -hmm. his uh, father and his uncle are immigrants from Aberdeenshire in Scotland. And his uncle, Patrick Henry, is an Anglican minister, uh, comes from Aberdeen in the early 18th century. And if you know anything about Scottish religion, whether Presbyterianism or Anglican or, you know, but just Protestant generally, it's a very uh, full of, of uh, great oratory and emotion, mm -hmm. passion, and they can give a sermon like nobody's business. And mm -hmm. so I would have to believe that he probably, as you rightly, I think, suggest, picked up a little bit of that flair from his uncle, who became mm. minister in Virginia in the 18th century, and is channeling, to some extent, that wonderful Scottish tradition of, of oral culture, of, uh, uh, of oratory, and of bringing a kind of emotional vibrance to the, uh, the pulpit and ultimately to politics just make me wonder, and you know, there's I haven't actually seen any suggestion, but it does make me kind of wonder if this, did Henry have just a touch of a brogue that uh, might have occasionally popped out, you know, it just as occasionally my Ohio accent will pop out, so but I try to suppress it. Uh, but there's just a little bit of a, a, a northeastern highlands uh, flair come out, and also makes me wonder what did what did John Adams sound like? I wish I knew. Um, I will say that we are fortunate enough to get this question a lot because of recent revivals of 1776, um, which is in fact based on John Adams' account of what happens, right, Philadelphia. Um, but we don't know. Certainly his New England accent is less goodwill hunting um, and probably a little bit closer to British. When he goes to the court of St. James in London in 1785, he does have a kind of oddball line in one of his letters about how he doesn't sound like everyone else. So here's the first American you know, minister to Great Britain realizing he never sounded like the proper British citizen he was supposed to be, which is, I think, a really powerful moment, right? You realize, oh, I was kind of independent all along. Um, so there's there's an interesting moment there. So we, we can't know for sure. We have a better sense when we put together our verified transcriptions of the Adams papers for each volume. Um, we collate, we read aloud all the manuscripts and we maintain all their little quirks of punctu punctuation and spelling. And a lot of times they're phonetic. The person to look at always is Abigail Adams to see how she's commenting. She uses aya a lot for yes. She says fairy grass for asparagus, Franklin with a G to talk about Benjamin Franklin. Um, and New York, she always runs together. Um, and as a, as a New Yorker, I always think, oh, Abigail. <laughs> but we do preserve that. So I'd say if you want a taste of what a New England accent is like that John Adams would have probably, you know, heard at the kitchen table, look at Abigail's letters. I imagine then at the table reads, uh, you're doing all, all doing various accents. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, we can try. We can try. <laughs> Uh, I just want to remind folks at home that uh, if you'd like to ask us some questions, please feel free to do so by dropping those in the comments, and we'll try to turn to those in just a few minutes. But so, you know, speaking of Abigail, one of the things we haven't touched on really is families. Um, Patrick Henry uh, had over a dozen children with two women, first Sarah, who unfortunately suffered from severe mental illness, and actually Mark Coulian has written a really important book about uh, her and uh, what she suffered through in the 18th century. And it's a topic that's still understudied in general, mental illness and the ways it was treated in the 18th century. But then 
later after Sarah unfortunately passed away, he marries Dorothea, who happened to be a, a cousin of, I believe, of Martha Washington, went on to have another brood of children who basically were responsible for settling Kentucky, it seems like, because there were so many of them. But Henry had, uh, and that's just a joke, they didn't actually set, settle Kentucky. But Henry had a huge family. Family was very important to him. And uh, I do want to talk about uh, uh, other aspects of plantation life uh, at Red Hill in just a moment, but sticking with uh, uh, Henry's family here for a second, very large family that he had to support, and in part why you know he continued to be a practicing lawyer and plantation owner throughout the rest of his life. John Adams doesn't have that many children, but he has some extremely famous children that emerge from his union with Abigail. Tell us a little bit about his family life. Sure. So Abigail and John Adams have three sons and a daughter who live to adulthood. So you're probably most familiar with the most promising right off the bat, John Quincy Adams, who is the sixth president. And even Abigail kind of singles him out early. He has two brothers, uh, Charles, who is a charmer who unfortunately dies of alcoholism and related issues early on. Thomas Boylston, who is a judge and kind of a man of letters of the early Republic, which was also a job um, at the time. And so their daughter, Nabby, is a really wonderful Jack, someone who we don't have a lot of correspondence for because fire happened to some Adam's letters too, unfortunately. Um, but she is a remarkable woman in her own right. Those are the kids. Um, right off the bat, as I said, Abigail isolates. John Quincy is kind of the most promising one and says, not all my geese may be swans. <laughs> so you kind of know where she's heading. <laughs> um, but they are incredibly involved in political and cultural life. I mean, the entire time. The, the thing to remember, I think this is so interesting. We've been preparing the next Adams Family Correspondence volume here. And it really is the Jefferson presidency. So what is it like to be an Adams in a Jefferson world? How do you continue to be a Federalist as the Democratic Republicans really surge into the center and take control of everything? And something you see is that they don't stop talking about politics. It's not like they go quietly to peace field and retire. They're very much engaged. And the heart of it happens in the family correspondence. It's really all the private back and forth, like what you write to your mom or dad is gonna be slightly different than what you say in a speech to the public. Uh, so it's always important to kind of, I think, read the series in tandem and think like, what's the family discussion at home? Because they are always, always talking, always writing for the archive, which is great for us. Um, we're very happy with that as scholars. Exactly, exactly. Well, I, I think it's important to point out in terms of, of family and other people who are associated with, with both of these men, that particularly in the case of Henry at Red Hill, mm -hmm. you know, Henry was a, a slave owner for most of his life, at least his adulthood. And when he's at Red Hill, he also has a number of enslaved people. And one of the exciting things that actually has emerged in recent years is Red Hill's reacquisition of what's called Quarter Place, mm -hmm. which not only was the grounds for, where a lot of the enslaved community lived, but also contains an extensive burial ground, uh, I believe, of something on the order of 147 graves, which is you know, particularly exciting because then we can begin to think about using the surviving evidence that we have of people who were enslaved at Red Hill. Can we connect those people who are buried in those graves and who labored uh, an enslavement at Red Hill. Can we connect them to descendants? And uh, remarkably, one of the things that's starting to happen now, which is very exciting, is that Red Hill is working with the descendant community to kind of discover who these enslaved people were and what their lives were like and how enslavement shaped their lives, but also in turn, how enslavement shaped the lives of their descendants. And to me, it's really kind of a very exciting time, as I said, because a lot of historic sites, Monticello, Mount Vernon, have the cemeteries of enslaved people. Uh, but Red Hill has got the opportunity to learn from a lot of the experiences of these sites of how to not only care for graves of the people who are 
uh, in turn there, but also the hard process of going through and figuring out, can we make connections between uh, past and the present? And it's one of the things I'm particularly excited about and you know, hopeful for the future. And it leads me in turn, Sarah, to a question to you, which is, what are some things about the of John Adams and the Adams family in general that are still plaguing Adams scholars? What do you not know that you wish you did and you have a sense of where to find these things? So I think you make a really important point that we need to think generously about the archive when we do research. It's great to have manuscripts. It's great to have as many manuscripts as we do here, but it's so important to match up manuscripts with the places where they went. So going to the Adams National Historical Park in Quincy, now known as Peacefield, researching the lives of servants there, that's something I wish someone would do. Um, and there's such a rich kind of social history to understand there. Um, thinking creatively about how industrialization really changed that neighborhood and changed the Adams's experience in such a small span of time, but also changed the lives of people who worked there. Um, that is something that is so important, I think, to understand. If I had kind of a, a second um, go, up, go forth and research um, prompt for folks tonight, I would say please revisit the John Adams legal papers. So when the legal papers editors started to reconstruct what we had, the best way I can describe this is if you took little John Adams, turned him upside around and shook out his pockets, you would have the legal papers. Because what we mostly have are stitched or pinned together, undated shreds and scraps of notes that he left behind about cases. So literally what he kept in his pocket, his pocketbook, um, is what we mostly have. But there's been so much great new early American legal history done in terms of making court records more accessible, of understanding how to read, you know, a docket, no matter from clerk to clerk, you know how to do this, um, how it may change. I wish someone would revisit the legal papers. And I want to say why, because for Adams or for any 18th century lawyer, the law was a spiritual corrective. It was a way to mend the morals of society. That's one thing. The second thing is when you look at what happens in a courtroom, it's a different dialogue. People have to answer sensitive questions. You have to get to the root of how something happened. People win or lose. People come back through the same courtroom. People have a history where they start to learn how to navigate the law. So looking at the legal papers again in a fresh perspective, I think will tell us what mattered to people as the colonies became a union and then a nation and then headed into war again. Um, so I think really exploring the legal papers with a critical eye, seeing where questions of gender and class especially made landmark decisions that people had to learn how to live with, please research that. I would love to learn more about that. I think that's a, an excellent appeal. I think, you know, I'd love to know more about Henry as a lawyer, too, the such that we can, given the extent of the evidence. Um, but speaking of the law as a kind of a moral corrective, and, and Sarah, this has been great, but we do have some questions coming in okay. from folks at home. And this one is Absolutely. for you, I think. Um, was Adams inspired by the sermons of Christian ministers like Henry? Yes. And also... No, because he liked to criticize what he heard from the pulpit. Um, so absolutely, yes. His faith, which is pretty much liberal, congregationalist, Unitarian adjacent, is basically shaped on the concept that God offers a path to redemption and salvation, but you must exercise the free will to find it. And with that comes the idea that he can accept or reject whatever he hears on Sunday. Um, he sees ministers very much as people who don't always get a fair shake in the community, but they are well-educated intellectuals who bring a lot of historical knowledge to the table. Um, Adams is still very much a providentialist. That is the flavor of the moment in American religion from the 17th century all the way right up until the Civil War, the Civil War is gonna shatter that to pieces. 
But the idea that there is a benevolent, omniscient God who hovers over the pages of history, who intervenes in human events and turns those pages of history to move things along, that's what Adams believed and that's what he would have heard. Um, so yes, he's very much influenced by that because if you are trying to separate from Great Britain and you need to rally people to a common cause, it helps to say providence is on your side. If you look through the Adams papers and you want to know about any Adams family religion, aside from reading Household Gods, of course, then what you want to keyword search is not God or Christ, but providence, because that is the language of the era. Well, let's move to another P word, which is politics. And I'll take a first crack at this one. But Ron would like to know, did Patrick Henry ever consider or was he considered uh, for the presidency? And I'm not sure if he ever considered the presidency or if there's something he aspired to. But what really is interesting is that, you know, we talked a little bit ago about Henry being this ardent anti-federalist, you know, part of that is stemming from his earlier resistance to the British crown. And he is dead set against the constitution and basically does everything he can in his oratorial power to defeat it. But once the constitution is essentially ratified and set in stone, he kind of accepts it. And what's Curious is where Jefferson and Madison, you know, emerge in the mid or the late 18th century as kind of the, the chief opponents of the Washington administration and Federalists in general and the Constitution's power. Henry kind of strangely emerges as a kind of quasi Federalist, and in, in such the extent that Washington asks him to become Secretary of State late uh, in uh, his uh, second term. He turns it down because he doesn't think he's going to be able to make enough money uh, to feed that very large brood he has. But he, uh, he kind of makes this weird political switch, and maybe not quite a switch, you might say, but uh, more of a, the, the Federalist one, the Constitution has passed, we have to accept it, and now we're going to work within the framework of that power. Of course, he was more than happy to hold people to account for potential abuses of that power. But he does kind of emerge as a, as a, a favorite of, not a favorite, but a, a sort of a favorite of Federalists. Even I believe Adams is interested in, in at least doing him some honor at that point late in his career. He does. He does reach out to him with a, a pretty important post, actually, to be in the second mission to France. Um, and there is a really heartbreaking letter that he writes in April 1799, declining it simply because of his health. Um, and he has, Patrick Henry has a very stirring um, way of declining in that he restates and reassures Adams of his patriotism, his loyalty to the nation. You know, and this is no small thing because just the party strife alone has kind of shredded a lot of Adams's support. And personally, it's affected him quite a bit. So I think it's a really beautiful gesture from Patrick Henry to John Adams. The last uh, question we have, and this will round out our evening, is from Scott. And it actually goes back to the theme of letters in our archive. Um, Hope no doubt springs eternal, but are there likely to be Henry or Adams writings yet to be discovered or made public? Uh, Sarah, please walk us through your hopes and dreams for undiscovered Adams papers. Always, we invite your finds. <laughs> um, we do find Adams papers at auction or in private hands, and we are fortunate enough often to accession um, reference scans of those letters. We always want to know about them. The Massachusetts Historical Society has been acquiring manuscripts since 1791 and making them available. So please get in touch. I think that there's always something out there, right? There's always one more thing that we can look for. And certainly with 10 generations worth to discover and more, um, we always have a new find to share. But I'd love to know about Patrick Henry. That's very interesting and intriguing. <laughs> well, I, I would hope, so. I have similar hopes as well, you know, despite the fire that, that claimed a lot of the papers in the turn of the 20th century, stuff does pop up from time to time. And I'll just give sort of one example. And it, it wasn't an original find, but I happened to be at the British Library a few years ago, very extremely fortunate to be there. And while I was there, I was doing a favor for, some folks at Red Hill and actually Sue Perdue, who is at Virginia Humanities these days. And 
happened to come across a copy of a letter between Henry and the governor of Spanish Louisiana during the revolution when Henry is governor of Virginia. So, you know, if it may not be the original, then there's there might be copies out there. And one of the other things that I find so intriguing is that when you're the governor in this period, you're signing a lot of land grants. Mm -hmm. And even though it's just a signature and it just says P. Henry, the fact that you are signing those and that you in a position of power are making possible expanded settlement in Virginia during the revolutionary period through the early Republic, because Henry serves a term during the revolution and a term after, uh, you're demonstrating in a very small way, even if it's just a signature, the ways in which power is working, ways in which he is deploying his authority as governor. And so even something like that, even if it's not a, a missive between Adams and Henry, but something as simple as that can tell us a lot about Henry as governor and life in the early Republic as well. So similar plea, if, if you've got letters out there, please red, let Red Hill know. And um, hopefully we can get them online someday. That'd be wonderful. Yeah. Well, Sarah, thank you very much. This has been fantastic as always. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Jim. Thanks to all the folks out there who are watching this evening. And thank you again, both to Red Hill and to the Massachusetts Historical Society and Virginia Humanities for helping to sponsor tonight's event. And we'll see you, you. Uh, yeah, we'll see you online again soon and have a good evening, everybody. Mm -hmm.